It's the mid-1980s and rock and roll is heading to an early grave with the presence of dance music, glam metal and hair bands taking over the mainstream music scene. Who can save it but a gritty rock band from the Sunset Strip, Guns N' Roses, sporting harsh songs of realistic tones of life, drug abuse and women. They took over the rock scene and received a reputation which earned the group the nickname, the most dangerous band in the world. Let's dive in and discover anything and everything to do with Guns N' Roses. In 1962, William Bruce Rose and Jeffrey Dean Isbell arrived on the planet in Lafayette, Indiana. Rose was raised in a heavily religious and apparently abusive household with an oppressive upbringing. Singing in his local church choir from an early age of four Sunday school attendants, Rose acquired a solace in music. Studying piano in high school and continuing interest in singing, Rose and Isbell became friends and formed a band after discovering a mutual interest in rock music. Jeff Isbell was raised in a creatively supported household. With his grandmother drumming in a swing jazz band, his discovery of music was inevitable. He adopted the name Izzy Strathland and a laid-back attitude in high school after sparking a friendship with Rose. Rose became a juvenile delinquent. Being arrested over 20 times in Lafayette, the local authorities threatened to charge him as a habitual criminal facing real jail time. On top of the awful environment Rose lived in, this was the breaking point that led to Rose leaving Indiana and moving to Los Angeles, California with Izzy in tow. He legally renamed himself W. Axel Rose after becoming engrossed in his first ill-fated band, Axel. Axel turned into Hollywood Rose, whose career was short-lived and eventually broke up. At the time, Izzy lived with LA Guns guitarist Tracy Guns. While they were searching for a new singer, Izzy suggested Axel. The crew combined forces and fused the names of Hollywood Rose and LA Guns to create the first iteration of Guns N' Roses, with bassist Ol Blick and drummer Rob Gardner. In 1964, Michael Andrew McKagan was brought into a family as the youngest of eight children in Seattle, Washington. Being called Duff since childhood, which is referred to as an Irish thing due to his heritage, he quickly adopted the nickname. During his early years, his brother Bruce taught him how to play bass guitar and was self-taught drums, an electric and acoustic guitar. Duff formed the successful post-punk band 10 Minute Warning in Seattle before moving to Los Angeles with one of his brothers where he excelled in the culinary business, but still pursued a career as a musician. The LA music scene didn't serve Duff too well until he answered a certain ad in a local newspaper. In 1965, Saul Hudson was born unto England from Ola Hudson, a famous costume designer whose most notable work is for David Bowie, and his father, Anthony Hudson, an artist who created album covers for musicians including Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. At the age of five, he and his father moved to rejoin his mother in California, and during his very bohemian raising with his mother, he was given the nickname Slash by actor Seymour Cassell, because he was always in a hurry, zipping around from one thing to the other. Slash became renowned in his skills on a BMX and caused trouble in a small biker gang in Hollywood during his adolescence. In the same year, Michael Coletti, whom was later renamed Steven Adler after his mother moved to Los Angeles and remarried, hit the earth like a ton of bricks. Adler grew up in the San Fernando Valley until he was 13 where he was sent to live with his grandparents in Hollywood. In a curious twist of fate and a twisted ankle, Slash and Steven met after Steven was in a bad skateboarding accident and Slash helped to take him home. The ground came rushing up to meet him at such a pace, I was like, oh, <laughs> this guy's got to be wounded. And he said, are you alright? And I said, yeah. Slash became engrossed in the idea of being in a band and playing guitar after meeting Adler and he showing Slash his music collection. When Slash's school teacher played songs for his students, Slash put the BMX aside and devoted himself to playing guitar. Slash went on to join and form the bands Tita Sloan and Road Crew, named after the Modehead song, We Are The Road Crew. Tracy Guns eventually left GNR and was replaced by Slash after Axel and Izzy saw him perform at a show and invited for him to join the band as the lead guitarist. Old Beck was replaced by Duff after he answered a newspaper ad and had a makeshift interview with Slash and his girlfriend. Before the lineup was finalised, Rob Gardner quit and was replaced by Steven Adler under suggestion of Slash. The famous lineup is finally here. What will they do next? The year is 1985. Axl Rose, Izzy Stratlin, Slash, Duff McKagan, and Steven Adler join the forces of Hollywood Rose and LA Guns to create Guns N' Roses. The lineup was finalized, and the band set off on a short, disorganized tour from Sacramento, California to Duff's hometown of Seattle. This tour became known as the Hell Tour. 
due to the desperate methods of transportation the band took and the rough treatment by venue owners, including hitchhiking with drug addicts and being refused payment. Duff stated in his autobiography, This trip had set a new benchmark of what we were capable of, what we could and would put ourselves through to achieve our goals as a band. Guns N' Roses gained ground in the Hollywood club scene, playing famed venues such as the Troubadour and the Roxy. They drew the attention of Geffen Records and were signed in March of 1986 and received an advance of $75,000. In December of the same year, the band released a four-song EP, Live Like a Suicide, which although posed as a live album, the four songs were overdubbed with crowd noise. The album was designed to keep the interest of the band alive while the group withdrew from the club scene to work in the studio. After several weeks in the studio, on July 21st, 1987, Appetite for Destruction was released with 12 tracks of head-banging harsh reality of life in Los Angeles. The original album cover was deemed too controversial for store shelves, so it was changed to the skull and cross design we all recognize. In the US, Welcome to the Jungle was the album's first single with accompanying music video. At first, the album and single lingered for almost a year without performing well, but when Geffen Records founder David Geffen was asked to lend support to the band, Geffen personally convinced MTV executives to play Welcome to the Jungle, although it was only played once, at 4am, on a Sunday. But thanks to heavy metal and hard rock fans request for the video and the song came in from the masses. The single was about Los Angeles and life on the streets. The most notable lyric of the song was set to Axel when he and a friend encountered a homeless man in New York attempting to scare the pair. About five or six years ago, I hitchhiked here and ended up stuck out in the middle of this place. Climbed up out, on a, out of the freeway. This little old black man comes up to me and my friend with our backpacks and about 10 bucks between us. And he goes, you know where you are? You in the jungle, baby! You know the game! And the true story, that ain't no lie! The single was featured in the 1988 Dirty Harry film, The Deadpool, starring Clint Eastwood, and the members of the band made a cameo appearance in the film. The second single of Appetite for Destruction is possibly the most popular song, Sweet Child of Mine. A love song Axel wrote as a poem for his at-the-time girlfriend, Evan Everly. The song and its accompanying music video received heavy airplay on both the radio and MTV. Despite the song being a huge success, even reaching the top of the US chart during the summer of 1998, Slash commented how much he disliked the song. And, uh, and then I still thought it was a joke, and Axel came in and started singing, and I hated that song. Appetite for Destruction had reached number one on the Billboard 200. To this day, the album has sold over 30 million copies worldwide and is the 11th best selling album in US history. In support of their debut album, Guns N' Roses toured extensively for 16 months across the globe, headlining dates in Europe and the US. The band opened in North American shows for The Cult, Motley Crue and Alice Cooper throughout the second half of 1987. Guns N' Roses proceed to tour the US, Australia and Japan while serving as the opening acts for Iron Maiden and Aerosmith. At the time, Aerosmith manager Tim Collins remarked, By the end of the tour, Guns N' Roses were huge. Rolling Stone magazine came to do a story on Aerosmith, but they were the ones that ended up on the cover of the magazine. Suddenly, the opening act was bigger than we were. Although during this time, multiple members of the band were known as notorious drug users, deemed as renegades and bad boys by the public eye, despite having layback attitudes with the story to tell with each location they were headlining.
Guns N' Roses' next album, GNR Lies, was released in November of 1988. It included the four songs of the band's 1986 EP, Life Like a Suicide, as well as four new acoustic tracks. The song Patience was the only single released from the album and peaked at number four in the US, while the album itself reached number two on the Billboard 200. The album cover features a parody of tabloid newspapers with images of the band and comedic news headlines, but it isn't a Guns N' Roses album without controversy. The song One in a Million raised accusations of racism and homophobia towards the lead singer Axl Rose. Axl denied he was a racist and defended his use of the racial slur. Because it just fit real quick. It fit, it was accurate, and it wasn't being derogatory to a large group but later conceded that he had used the word as an insult towards the black people who had tried to rob him. In response to the allegations of homophobia, Axel stated he considers himself pro-heterosexual and blamed this attitude on bad experiences with gay men. The band had reached a massive high with their two albums, and although the success will continue, no one had any idea how things would turn. In 1990, Guns N' Roses returned to the studio to begin the band's most ambitious undertaking yet, although it began with disaster. Drummer Steven Adler was briefly fired for his drug use, but was reinstated after he vowed he would stop taking drugs. During the recording session of Civil War, Adler was unable to perform well due to his struggles with cocaine and heroin addiction, causing over 30 takes of the song to be recorded. He couldn't play. He would lie to us, and we'd go over to his place and find behind the toilet and find stuff underneath the sink. He couldn't leave his drugs, but there's other things beside the band that he was involved in with his drugs that have been very dangerous and scary, and I, I want nothing to do with him. I did everything I possibly could to try and kill myself. Adler was fired on July 11th, 1990 as a result, and later filed a lawsuit against the band. The drummer position was filled by Matt Sorum, who had briefly played with the Cult. Along with his change in lineup came Dizzy Reed, taking the position of keyboardist. Everybody that I knew, I thought were my friends, took everything they could from me. After countless hours in the studio, the group had enough music to release a double LP. On September 17th, 1991, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 was finally released. The tactic of releasing a double album paid off, when the albums debuted at number 2 and number 1 respectively in the Billboard charts. Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 contained mixed tracks of hard rock and soft rock ballads, including a harsh track of Axel ranting about deadbeat journalists personally naming them in the song, Get In The Ring. That goes for all you punks in the press that want to start shit by printing lines instead of the things we said. That means you and you said you're a hit parader. Circus Magazine, Rick Wall at Kerrang, Bob Guzzioni Jr. at Spin. What you pissed off because your dad gets more pussy than you? Fuck you! Suck my fucking dick! You be ripping off the fucking kids while they be paying their hard earned money to read about the bands they want to know about. Written lies, starting controversy. You want to antagonize me? Antagonize me, motherfucker! Get in the ring, motherfucker! And I'll kick your bitchy little ass!
Despite the success of a double album, or influenced by it, the remaining members of Guns N' Roses continued in their drinking and drug habits. From the double album came several music videos, the most famous of which are a trilogy of videos for the songs Don't Cry, November Rain, and A Strain, with outrageously high budgets for each. Don't Cry was the first GNR music video without Izzy, and featured the famous Where's Izzy sign a fan held up at a show. November Rain was released with high praise and has been considered one of the best rock music videos to this day, with Slash's legendary guitar solo. A Strange was a strange video and a mess of a production. Which is why there's that great shot of his shoe floating to the bottom of the uh, of the seabed because we were just trying to find things to shoot to that point. The song itself received moderate praise, but the video was deemed weird for a hard rock band to produce something like this, and the band felt the same way. But I remember when we went and did A Strange, it was the last video and of that trilogy. And we'd, we'd been on the road for about two and a half years and we were all beat tired, and the album had sold 30 million copies, and, you know, we were like, God, you know, why do we have to make this video, you know, I'd, can't we just put the money up and, you know, go buy a new car or something? That's the strange artistic road Axel took the band down with his years created on of inner conflict between the bandmates, and is thought to be a leading contribution to the breakup. Life, and it really was starting to unravel then. Prior to and after the release of the Usual Illusion albums, Guns N' Roses embarked on a 28th month long tour that was titled the Usual Illusion World Tour. It is considered to be the longest rock tour in history and became famous for both its financial success and the many controversial incidents that occurred at the show. In the summer of 1991, at the St. Louis show, during the performance of Rocket Queen, Axel discovered a fan was filming the show with a camera. Asking the venue security to take the camera when they refused, he decided to take the camera himself, jumping into the audience and tackling the fan. It was later revealed that the fan and the members of the local security were part of a local biker gang known as the Saddle Tramps, who allowed the attendee to continue agitating Axel. Axel stormed off the stage, giving one of the most memorable lines in Guns N' Roses' live history. Well, thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. As for how the band felt about this, St. Louis received a personal message from them in the thank you section of the Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 inlay. It wouldn't be the last time Guns N' Roses would face problems on this tour. Izzy Stratton abruptly quit the band in November of 1991 after a repeat of the St. Louis concert nearly unfolded at a show in Germany. On top of Axel's behaviour, which included turning up late for shows as well as sporting a bad attitude with band members. Also the difficulties of being around Slash, Sorm and Duff due to his newfound sobriety and his bandmates continuing alcohol and substance addictions. Izzy returned to Lafayette, India, where he began working on new material and formed a new band, Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds. They released a self-titled album in October of 1992, to which received positive reviews from Rolling Stone magazine. Izzy and the Hounds went on a brief tour of Europe, Australia and North America. Several dates of the Usual Illusion tour were cancelled as they searched for a new rhythm guitarist, the slot was filled by Gilby Clark. Although in 1992, Izzy returned for several weeks after Gilby was in a motorcycle accident on the tour. Guns N' Roses made a brief appearance at the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert in 1992, performing Paradise City, Alice Cooper's Only Women Bleed, and one of the best performances on Knocking on Heaven's Door. Slash performed Tie Your Mother Down with the remaining members of Queen and Axel sang We Will Rock You and performed Bohemian Rhapsody in a duet with Elton John.
Originally, there were calls to drop the band from the bill due to the controversial song One in a Million. Queen's lead guitarist Brian May dismissed the calls and supported their involvement, calling it very progressive for Axel to be involved. Despite the comments of homosexuals Axel made in the song One in a Million, Freddie Mercury was a huge inspiration for Axel. In later 1992, Guns N' Roses joined Metallica on a massive rock tour headlining stadiums across America. Although during a show in August of that year at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, Metallica's lead singer James Hetfield suffered second degree burns to his hands and face after a pyrotechnics malfunction. There was an incident with uh, the pyrotechnics. Unfortunately, James uh, is on his way to the hospital right now and we're very sorry but we can't continue the concert for you guys tonight. This led to Metallica cancelling the rest of their set, causing GNR to come out earlier than expected. After a long delay causing rising tensions in the audience, Guns N' Roses took the stage. However, the shortened time between the sets did not allow for adequate tuning of the stage monitors, resulting in the band not being able to hear themselves and causing several other audio problems. On top of Axel having throat pains and being unable to sing. And I realized I'm gonna hurt myself. Right. I told Slash two more songs. If it's not if we can't get it fixed, I gotta go. With all these problems, the band left the stage cancelling the rest of their set. This led to a huge audience riot leaving multiple people injured and a dozen arrests. The Use Your Illusion World Tour ended in Buenos Aires, Argentina on July 17th, 1993. This show would mark the last time Sorum, Gilby and Slash would play a live show with Axel. Following the two and a half year world tour, the band needed a break. Slash did what he does best and formed his own band named Slash's Snake Pit in 1994 and recorded his first album, It's Five O'Clock Somewhere, which featured lyrics venting Slash's frustrations against Axel. Slash attempted a tour with his band, but support for the tour was stopped when he was called in to work on more Guns N' Roses material. Axel and Slash still had a hostile relationship at this point, which only grew worse over time. Duff released the solo album, Believe In Me, on which he sang lead vocals and played virtually every instrument. Duff also formed the supergroup Neurotic Outsiders, with Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols, John Taylor of Duran Duran, and his Guns N' Roses bandmate Matt Sorum. Neurotic Outsiders released one self-titled album on Maverick Records in 1996, and played a brief tour of North America and Europe. Duff was also one of the last people to have seen Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain before he died on April 5th, 1994. They sat next to each other on a flight from Los Angeles to Washington. We, we got to Seattle, we went to Baggs Claim, and he was, he was pretty down. And um, uh, a friend of mine, this guy Eddie, met me at Baggs Claim in Seattle. Kurt and Eddie went out to have a smoke, and, and my friend Eddie came back in. I said, hey man, you know, Maybe we should take him to, over to the house tonight, you know? And we were drinking, you know? So it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a thing like uh, I foresaw anything by any means. But he was down and he was on his own. And uh, so Eddie went back out to, to get Kurt, and right at that moment, his car had picked him up. During this time off, all members of Guns N' Roses attempted to become sober and get off drugs, with Duff, Sorum, and Slash all going into rehab clinics. Marine video, I wasn't in that much because I was trying to kick drugs, and um, I walked into the trailer, and I remember Billy Idol was there, and Duff, and all the guys, and I remember there being a big pile of cocaine, it looked something like that movie Scarface. Duff suffered from pancreatitis, causing his pancreas to swell and cause inner third degree burns. He said, just kill me. Just kill me. I can't stand this. He was told by doctors he would be dead in a month if he did not stop drinking. Duff made several attempts to curb his drinking in the past, but this health crisis was the incentive to become sober for good. I knew at that point that my life was going to change, and the only person that could change it was me. 
In mid-1993, the lawsuit Steven Adler put towards Guns N' Roses was finally settled out of court. He received a payment check of $2,250,000 and received 15% royalties for the songs he recorded. At this point, Steven was still abusing drugs, which led to a stroke leaving him briefly comatose in 1996. People say he never fully recovered from the stroke or his drug habits. Puff, puff. Puff, puff. Roll, roll, roll the joint. Twisted at the end, sparking up big and up the cast of two. In November of 1993, Guns N' Roses released a collection of punk and glam rock covers entitled The Spaghetti Incident, with Duff singing lead vocals for most of the tracks. Slash describes the record of the album as spontaneous and unpainted. The title of the album is an inside joke referring to a food fight that occurred between Axel and Adler as Adler's lawyer described the fight as The Spaghetti Incident. But with a new Guns N' Roses album, it will come with new controversy. Axl Rose attempted to bring his cover of infamous murderer Charles Manson's song Look At Your Game Girl onto the spaghetti incident. The song wasn't included on events tape sent to reviewers because he wanted it to speak for itself and saying it was for the fans. This decision sparked outrage in the music community and in the Geffen signing rooms. David Geffen himself discouraged the inclusion of the song. The Spaghetti Incident debuted at number 4 on the Billboard charts and sold 190,000 copies in the first week of its release. Despite initial success, the album did not match the sales of the Usual Illusion albums, and its release consequentially led to increased tension within the band. Despite the controversy and, in retrospect, poor sales, the Spaghetti Incident did produce one very good cover of Misfits Attitudes, sang by Duff. Duff also sang this at multiple live performances with Guns N' Roses. The tension within the band was just the beginning of the already sinking ship that was Guns N' Roses. Due to his involvement with drugs and alcohol, an overdose was seemingly inevitable. Slash was found dead in a hotel hallway in San Francisco. I got a phone call at 5.30, 6 a.m. at my room from the front desk saying, Mr. Reese, one of your uh, band members is passed out in front of the elevator on the 6th or 5th floor. So I throw on some pads, jump, run out my room, and Slash is dead. I mean, d dead, blue dead. He had no pulse. When the paramedics arrived, Slash had already been dead for a total of 8 minutes before they managed to resuscitate him. This wasn't the end of Slash's health problems when in 2001 he was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy due to substance abuse and was given between 6 days and 6 weeks to live. Slash survived through physical therapy and was fitted a defibrillator which almost gave him a heart attack during a show with Michael Jackson at Madison Square Garden due to his unpredictable heart rate. Many issues with Axel, management, and the hostility in their relationship led to Slash leaving Guns N' Roses in October of 1996 after a quick phone call with GNR management simply stating, he's done. Basically it was just that I, you know, I'm done. I think that was... Uh, Who said that? I did. I'm done. Yeah. Duff eventually left in the August of 1997 due to the band being under a hiatus, and drummer Matt Sorum was fired in 1997 after an argument with Axel, and he rejoined with his former band, The Cult. I think you've got a, a situation where nobody involved wants to revisit. It's not just me, it's the, the whole, you know, the whole band. It seems like the glory days of Guns N' Roses could be over after the members have abandoned ship. Slash leaving caused a big problem for Guns N' Roses as well as himself, leaving GNR without lead guitarist and Slash without a job. Almost overnight, Slash reformed his former band, Slash's Snake Pit, and in the year 2000, they released another album, Ain't Life Grand, which due to the merger between Geffen and Interscope Records, had to be bought from them since Interscope said, this isn't the type of music our label produced. Ain't Life Grand was released under Kosher Records and met its release date. Although the album was declared as mediocre by its audience, and Rolling Stone magazine even mentioned that it wasn't Slash's fault, just the rest of his band. Eventually, due to lack of commitment from his bandmates, Slash disbanded his snake bit. This wouldn't be the last time the merger between Geffen and Interscope Records would cause problems for the old Guns N' Roses members.
Due to the stagnation of Guns N' Roses, Duff quit and moved back to Seattle in 1999, where he met many of his old friends, including Pearl Jam's Stone Gossard. He convinced Duff to reform his old band, 10 Minute Warning. They released two albums titled Sub Pop and Beautiful Disease. Unfortunately, the latter was never released due to the legal confusion between Geffen Records and Interscope Records when the two companies merged in 1999. Duff formed the band Loaded when he wanted to tour with his ill-fated solo album. The tour performed surprisingly well and they published a live record in 1999. Loaded released their first album with the 2001 record Dark Days, then being a hiatus because of the formation of Velvet Revolver. Duff returned to Loaded, releasing two more albums with 2009's Sick and 2011's The Taking. Izzy and Duff briefly met again to work on Izzy's second solo album, 117 Degrees. Released in March of 1998, Izzy let the album speak for itself with no live performances and very few interviews. Unfortunately, the merger between Geffen and Interscope Records also led to Izzy being dropped from the label's roster. During the turn of the century, Izzy released several more albums and eventually rejoined Guns N' Roses in several shows from 2006. Izzy's quiet solo career continues to this day with single releases over iTunes. Bringing along former Guns N' Roses drummer Matt Sorum, rhythm guitarist Dave Kushner, and former lead singer of Stone Temple Pilots, Scott Whelan, Slash had put his hopes towards a no-nonsense rock band with as little drama and experimentation as possible. They became known as the rock supergroup Velvet Revolver, producing two albums with 2004's Contraband and 2007's Libertad. The group won a Grammy Award for Best Hard Rock Performance in 2005 for their single on contraband, Slither. Did Slash finally get his wish of the no-nonsense hard rock band that he wanted? Yes. So we thought. And uh, it seemed like a good idea, but Scott was really, really difficult. Due to Scott Whelan's lack of direct commitment to Velvet Revolver, rejoining Stone Temple Pilots and creating his own cover band known as Camp Freddy, as well as Slash progressing in his own solo career, and Duff briefly reforming Loaded and joining the rock band Jane's Addiction, Velvet Revolver has been on a hiatus since 2009. A hiatus that didn't seem to have an end in sight. Velvet Revolver performed a one-off reunion in January of 2012 for a benefit concert for the late John O'Brien, and there were no immediate plans to reform due to the successful solo careers of each member, although Scott was fired from Stone Temple Pilots due to drug addiction and persistent tardiness. He briefly formed the punk rock band The Wildabouts, but in early December of 2015, Scott had died on his tour bus from overdosing on cocaine, alcohol, and methylene dioxyamphetamine. Steven Adler formed a band in 2003 named Adler's Appetite, whose career mostly featured covering songs from the original Guns N' Roses album Appetite for Destruction, but later released several original singles, the most notable is the track Alive. During a brief tour celebrating the 20th anniversary of Appetite for Destruction, Adler's Appetite was joined on stage by Steven's former bandmates Duff and Izzy. Slash was apparently in attendance, but did not join them on stage because he did not want to incite a Guns N' Roses reunion. In 2011, Steven formed a new band simply titled Adler, and released the album Back From The Dead in 2012. During this time of creator return, Steven was still going through rehab due to his drug addiction. But what about Axel and Guns N' Roses? From 1994, GNR went under a six year long hiatus before Rose resurfaced at Rock in Rio 3, with the new lineup featuring Richard Fortas, Tommy Stinson, and Dizzy Reed. Although this lineup has been the subject of change, these members were the most consistent of Axel's bandmates. Axel planned a 10 year tour in support of his new album, Chinese Democracy, which at this point was nowhere near completion. Despite plans for the tour were in motion, the majority of the scheduled concert over the next two years did not take place, on top of when Guns N' Roses made a surprise performance at the 2002 MTV Video Music Awards, but was critically panned due to the odd lineup 
and the involvement of the guitarist, Buckethead, and a ride in Vancouver causing over $100,000 of damage after Axel failed to show up for a concert. The promoters cancelled the tour, and Axel withdrew from the public eye until 2006, when he stated, People will hear music this year. Since then, Guns N' Roses toured extensively, and at one point reuniting Izzy Stratlin with GNR, with guest appearances apparently confirming that Izzy and Axel are on good terms. Almost out of nowhere, in November of 2008, Chinese Democracy was finally released, and the associated tour began the following year. The album received mixed reviews, given the very high bar Guns N' Roses set themselves with the prior lineups. Hesitation was understandable. Instead of natural gritty rock GNR is renowned for, Chinese Democracy was seen as a lesser imitation, with a hard punk vibe more than rock. Although the album was still successful and received praise for its singles, This I Love, Better, and Street of Dreams. Duff also rejoined GNR on several occasions from 2012 to 2014, playing as the opening act Loaded and Duff playing on stage with Guns N' Roses. Duff and Axel seem to get along very well, and it appears that they are on good terms. It seems Axel is slowly rebuilding his relationship with the old Guns N' Roses lineup, but I think we're forgetting someone very important. In 2010, during the hiatus of Velvet Revolver, Slash released his self-titled collaboration album, featuring rock icons including his past Guns N' Roses bandmates, as well as Dave Grohl, Ozzy Osbourne, Lemmy Kilmister, Iggy Pop, and many more. The album received positive reviews, and the tour commenced with the backing of rhythm guitarist Bobby Schneck, Alice Cooper drummer Brent Fitz, bassist Todd Kearns, and lead vocalist on two songs on the album, Miles Kennedy of Alter Bridge. This lineup was known as Slash, featuring Miles Kennedy and The Conspirators, and have since released two more studio albums with Miles and The Conspirators, 2012's Apocalyptic Love, and 2014's Word on Fire, both of which had an associated tour which lasted around a year for each run, and received great praise. Slash also released a live album, Made in Stoke, in 2011 that was recorded in England in his hometown of Stoke-on-Trent, the day after his 45th birthday. In 2012, Guns N' Roses were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by punk group Green Day, with Duff, Slash, Matt, and Steven all making an appearance to accept the award, although Axie and Izzy were nowhere to be seen. Everyone knew Izzy wouldn't come because he doesn't care about awards or past projects, and they respected that. Also, Izzy gave a heartfelt message thanking his past band members and fans for their support. However, Axel openly stated he doesn't want to be somewhere he isn't actually wanted or respected, and declined the induction. In 2015, there were apparent talks of Slash and Axel being on good terms after a period of uncertainty in Guns N' Roses, with only Axel, Dizzy Reed, Richard Fortas, and new drummer Frank Ferrer in the band itself. At the end of 2015, there were several teasers of a possible Guns N' Roses tour played before Star Wars The Force Awakens in America, black and white footage of a crowd with Welcome to the Jungle playing before mysteriously cutting out. In April of 2016, it was announced that Guns N' Roses will headline Coachella and then set off on a full-scale reunion tour of North America. The tour was called Not In This Lifetime, as a callback to the remarks Axel made in an interview in 2012 on the topic of a reunion of the original lineup. Before embarking on the tour, Guns N' Roses returned to their origins in Los Angeles to perform at the same venue they performed in 30 years ago, The Troubadour, with a retro $10 ticket price. 
During the Trouble Show, Axel rose. No way. Axel fell and broke his foot. Undeterred by this, Axel borrowed Dave Grohl's customized guitar throne, which he used when he broke his foot when touring with the Foo Fighters. Guns N' Roses are tearing up North America with their comeback tour, but on the other side of the world, a rock icon is about to take a huge hit. Axel briefly took over the reins of ACDC after Brian Johnson said he's at risk of losing his hearing and needs time to recover. Axel shared the stage with ACDC guitarist Angus Young when he appeared as a guest with Guns N' Roses at Coachella 2016. Several weeks later, it was announced that Axel will be taking Brian's place for the final two legs of the Rock or Bus tour, Europe and North America. The shows of Axel received mixed to positive reviews, but overall, the ACDC band and crew said they have good chemistry with Axel and are fine to continue working with him. Several pictures reveal that Duff and Slash may have been attending the ACDC shows in which Axel performed. During this time, Axel was performing at Guns N' Roses during ACDC's time off in the late summer months. After the Rock or Bust tour, Angus Young stated he'd be working on a new ACDC album with Axel Rose as the lead singer. Although since this announcement, there has been no news on this new ACDC album featuring Axel. Guns N' Roses returned to America, selling out stadium pre-sales across the world, with most of the original lineup in tow, now featuring Melissa Reese, Dizzy Reed, Richard Fortas, Frank Ferrer, as well as Axel, Slash and Duff, returning to the stage for the first time in over 20 years. Steven Adler, the original Guns N' Roses drummer, returned for five shows, playing the drums on two Appetite for Destruction songs, Out To Get Me and My Michelle, but Adler has not played any shows since then and apparently Use Your Illusion drummer Matt Sorum was not asked to be a part of this tour. But the 26-year-old question still applies. Where's Izzy? During an interview with Duff and Axel giving their two cents on the tour, Axel gave an uncertain answer to a question concerning the original Guns N' Roses rhythm guitarist. About Izzy, it's like, you know, you, you could have a conversation and think it's one way, and the next day it's another way, so... And I'm not trying to take any shots at Izzy, it's just... You know, his thing's kind of his thing, whatever that is. Right. Izzy Stradlin caught wind of this interview and gave his own explicit reason why he is not a part of the reunion tour. This brought up questions of, out of the millions the band is making with this reunion tour, whose pocket is it going into, and how is it being shared? Despite all these questions, Guns N' Roses is still rocking on through the world in the Not In This Lifetime tour, with the tour receiving great praise thanks to the involvement of Slash and Duff, reworking Chinese democracy songs with superior guitar work and Axel retaining his devastating voice. The future of Guns N' Roses is unknown at this point, with rumours of new material surfacing, but current rhythm guitarist Richard Fortas says, Guns N' Roses have never sounded better. And it's hard to argue with that. <laughs>